Hi, everybody. Welcome to The Free Black Woman. I am Alicia Renice, and today we have an amazing guest. Her name is Tasha, and I'm going to allow her to introduce herself. So, hi, Tasha. Let everybody know who you are, what you're about, and everything. Okay. Hi. So, this is always awkward for me to uh, (laughs) tell everyone who I am, but right now in my life, I would say that I am a woman who is very eclectic. Um, Everything about me changes um, based upon experiences. I'm always evolving. I'm always learning. I'm always transforming. And so I would say eclectic would be the best way to describe me. But I'm also very consistent with who I am. No matter what space I show up, I always remain my authentic self. Um, I feel like that a big part of me is really knowing who I am and what I can manifest. And so I am a hope um, giver. I am a joy bringer. I'm a light bearer. I am very expressive, um, sometimes artsy. (laughs) And um, I'm a lover of music and laughter. Yeah, um, that would that would be me. And so a lot of the things that contribute to the those elements that I described um, would show up in what I do. And so I'm an author three times over. I am the founder of an organization called Royalty Refines. OK, um, <laughs> and um, I work in the education field. Um, so, yeah new things on the horizon with that, which I'll share later. But um, <laughs> so, yeah, that that's who I am. Yes. Awesome. I love that. Um, I love that you were saying you're a hope bringer, a hope bringer, you said, and a joy, a hope giver and a joy bringer. Yeah. Like, do you feel like you were always those things, like even when you're younger or did you, that's something that you had to like learn how to, I guess, take hold of and share with other people? Yeah. So um, when I was younger, I've always been a, a hope giver but I never knew exactly what it was. Like I knew that being around family, um, I didn't like discord, tension, um, chaos, anything like that. So I was always the one trying to, you know, bring peace into, into that environment and often known as like the glue or the rock. So a lot of times, you know, in the family, everyone would say, you know, when I come in, I remain even tempered and just try to figure out how I had a way with words to really try to bring everyone together. Like community is big for me. And so I always wanted everyone to kind of sit down and really talk about what's going on. I didn't like anyone being mad around me. And yeah. so I just didn't know exactly what that was. I just, mm-hmm. that was something that always resonated with me now. As I grew older, I didn't really understand that I carried the joy. Um, <laughs> I think it was really being in a dark place is what really taught me how to embrace that. Um, Mm. I would be mad or I would be upset or disgruntled about something, but instead of me really like dealing with it, I would just dismiss it. It was Mm. just kind of like, you're upset, you're mad, but then it's almost like, do you even deserve to be mad kind of thing? You know, I would be dismissive of how I felt in that moment or thought that being mad or angry in that moment kind of took away who I really was. Yeah. So. Yeah. So let's, I, I, I think that's interesting when you say, when you said that you didn't know if you deserve to be angry or I guess any other feeling except for joyful. So like, why did you feel, I guess, I guess like um, unworthy of like, or, or undeserving of being angry or being in an angry space? It was always the response that I would give. So, you know, being someone who is naturally calm, um, people just kind of expect you to be easygoing all the time. Um, they always expect that if something happens, you're just supposed to take it. Like you're not supposed to own or acknowledge what happened yeah. in that moment. And so the moment I would speak up or say something about how I feel the response given wasn't necessarily a good one. It was yeah. always viewed as, you know, but you're the one that's usually the calm one. Like, what do you mean? You know, kind of thing. Or did someone tell you that you should be mad kind of thing as if other feelings aren't valid, you know? So then it just kind of makes it, makes you question a little bit, like, really? Like, did I overreact? Or, you know, you really start playing these different scenarios in your head Mm -hmm. as if like, maybe I viewed it wrong or, you know, maybe it didn't happen the way that I think it did when 
honestly, that person was just being dismissive, right. which allowed you to internalize it that way. Yeah. Yeah. Like, at what point did you realize, like, did you hold that power? Like, did you take that power back to be like, no, nah, I'm upset and I'm and it's valid. Like, you know, because I know that I struggle with that a lot of times. It's like, I'll express myself and then people will be dismissive. And, and it's because like they have you in this box, right? Like they're like, oh, Alicia, you're the happy one. So like, if you're anything but happy, it's like, oh, well, we can't rock with you. I don't know what's going on here as if you're not human. So like, how did you, how did you like, I guess, get the courage to really be like, no, like, this is, this is what's happened. This is how it made me feel. And my feelings are valid. I think quite honestly, it wasn't until... Hmm, maybe a couple years after my sexual assault, um, for a while, I was very withdrawn. Um, it was just very closed off. I didn't really let people in because I felt like, you know, if I let people in, they're going to try to take something from me because mm. that's the only way I could identify a relationship at that point of any fashion. Um, and then also, you know, being the calm one or being the happy or joyful one, people always come to you with a need, but they don't necessarily give a mutual exchange. So um, in that, I just did not like how heavy I felt, you know, mm -hmm. after the sexual assault and then just not really feeling like I had an outlet to really mm -hmm. share that information. Like, you know, people would kind of look at me like, okay, why is she always to herself or what's really going on or the way that she processes information or the way that she interacts in, you know, group settings, what's up with that. And so yeah. I feel like, you know, if people don't really know or people don't really understand if I'm not saying anything. And so I felt like, you know what, what's the worst that can happen? Because in my mind, I felt like being sexually assaulted was the bottom, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> so kind of like, if I talk about it, I mean, it already happened, you know, so what's the worst that could happen after that? And so um, the first person I actually told was my brother and my brother and I are super close mm. and we talk literally every day. And so when I told him, he was like, wait, what? Run there by me again. Like I tried to slide it into the conversation. Yeah. He was just like, no, 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 no. You know, tell me exactly what happened. And then in that moment, the fact that he actually like listened intently to what I had to say, it just really felt freeing. Yeah. And so little by little, I'm like, OK, the more I can actually accept the fact that this happened, it no longer owns me. Yeah. That space. Yeah. Oh, so. So let's talk about this. Right. And um, uh, I feel like recently with the wave of like me, too, or, you know, just people being outed for, you know, their their crimes and their yeah. sins against people. Um, I feel like people are starting to be, to feel more empowered, I guess, to speak out on, on what's happened to them, whether they're sexually assaulted or like harassed or, you know, whatever, like, cause I, I feel like sexual assault is, is a, um, a spectrum, you know what I'm saying? Like, it, and, and so some people would invalidate it. Oh, well, you know, you weren't raped or you weren't, you know what I'm saying? Like, so almost like it's, a, it's lesser than when all of it is a violation, like it's all a violation. Um, <laughs> Yeah. And, uh, and I, I love that, that you own, not necessarily like, I don't want to say what happened to you as if like, this makes you who you are, but it's right. like, this is what happened to me. And you've all, almost like turned it into something that empowers you. So like, yeah, how mm -hmm. did you go from like the trauma to owning, I guess yourself, right? Like reclaiming yourself, re reowning yourself and being like, this is what happened to me. And I'm going to use this for, for good. Yeah, so um, it's so funny because my favorite scripture is Romans eight twenty eight, and <laughs> and it just for me that was the driving force of really understanding that every experience, whether good or bad, um, really is a part of the packaging my DNA. And what I had to do to really be honest with myself is really say, you know what, this happened, but it happened in that moment it doesn't mean that you have to carry that with you for a lifetime. And so even though in that moment you felt this way, you felt that way, you need a reminder of who you really are. And so um, for me, that's really where royalty refined was birthed from because 
I had to go through my own refining process. It was like, even though I feel this way, even though this hurts, even though there's some discontentment, one thing that remained constant was my value. It didn't change. And so it was like, with all of that, it's like, okay, so what? You know, this is just an added layer to the amazing story that you're going to share, right? And it's just like, okay. So you're still telling me, God, that you still love me. You still tell me that I have purpose. Mm -hmm. You're still telling me that I'm royalty and that I'm yours, even in spite of this. And God's like, yeah, (laughs) you know, like that, that's exactly who you are. And I don't want you to ever forget it. And so for me, I had to actually relearn the power of no. Um, For me, I struggle with boundaries because I go back to the root. The root was when my father passed away, I understood the lack of boundaries early on. (laughs) And I say that because in the community that we lived in, um, our family was already so private, but his death was public Mm -hmm. to the fact that, I mean, it's on the front page of papers, you know, it's in the news. And so after a while, Um, things started to shift on how I was viewed from that lens. And so after a while, I'm like, okay, people are becoming evasive, intrusive, and, you know, thinking that they feel entitled to what's going on in my personal life, because they already bear witness to whatever was presented publicly. And so after that, the sexual assault was a reminder of, okay, listen, mm -mm. now you have to reinforce those boundaries that you once had. But in order for you to establish that, you have to acknowledge the seed that you watered from the beginning because you allowed the death of your father and that experience to already overtake you that you didn't really know how to operate outside of that. And so that was when I really had to get to the bottom of, okay, Tasha, what are you holding on to? Why are you afraid to release it? Why are you most importantly afraid of who you are, what you see? And why do you feel like you have to hide those areas of your life to feel loved? Yeah, that's so good. That's so good. And, and I, I, I admire you so much. I admire you and other people who share their story like that, because I feel like there are so many people who, who will never, you know, share. Um, and, you know, for their reasons, like their reasons are their reasons. I don't think that anyone should have to feel like outed, so to speak, yeah. mm-hmm. um, you know, to, to say, oh, yeah, this happened to me. Like, I, you know, this is my trauma. Um, but I still feel like it's still empowering to see other people be so vocal about it and be so open and say, yo, like, I'm not alone. There is hope for me. I can get through this. So I I, I love that. Um, so I wanted to, you brought up a lot of things. First of all, I, even, I never even, I knew that your father had passed, but I never knew that it affected you that way. Like I never thought about the boundaries, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and that's, to me, that's just like eye-opening and amazing. Like, wow, like that is, that is real. Like people putting their hands kind of on you and in your life, which mm-hmm. is, feels violating. Like it feels like, okay, <laughs> And I'm like 16 at the time, right? So it's like, I'm still trying to figure out what is going on in my life. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, (laughs) yes. So did you, did you, I know you mentioned um, Royalty Refined Mm -hmm. and you said that's where it was birthed out of. Can you tell us a little bit more about Royalty Refined and like your vision for it and your hope for it for other people? Sure. So um, Royalty Refined, actually, um, the vision I had for it, still do, you know, is that it just really becomes a, sense of community. Um, You know, yes, I have a team, but I don't want everyone to feel like it's us and them, right? Because I want everyone to understand that they are also royalty refined, like they are formed and fashioned in the father's hand, like it doesn't matter. Um, Wherever you are, if we've never met, it's cool, like that's who you are. And so the vision for royalty refined is really for um, millennial women to really, you know, come together in a network way to like even share their experiences of trauma or loss. Mm -hmm. Um, And that can look like, you know, for me, sexual assault, but then for somebody else, it could be harassment or could even be bullying. It doesn't matter, right? I'll experience trauma in different ways, but really having that space, um, a shared community to really discuss it, to really um, acknowledge their feelings associated with it. But then most importantly, How do they work on the steps of overcoming those things and not saying that you have to forget about them, but how are you able to mend those broken pieces and understand that it's crafted into something beautiful for you Mm -hmm. to move forward to walk away with. And so that's something that I want people to understand. Like sometimes I find that people thrive off of um, the drama or the negatives 
in their lives that they struggle with celebrating the positives. And so, you know, even if it's, oh, I got up today and I didn't feel sad, that's a win, <laughs> you know? And, and that was the whole point, you know, that why I said royalty refined is something that I think is needed. Um, and so for that, um, I only do like two events um, per year. Like there's a big conference, New Found Esteem and Worth, that we used to have in September. And we really talk about, we tackle different things that um, I'm just one of those who likes to think of um, unconventional topics and ideas. So like this year, it's radically royal. And that really stems from really recognizing that your journey is yours and that no matter what society or what family members or friends may tell you what you should be doing, you are honoring the weight of your journey and understanding that your GPS navigation system is different from the sister next to you and be yeah. okay with that. Because oftentimes, if you think about women in our age bracket, everyone has a say so on when you should get married, when you should have children, yeah. um, when you should really have a career kind of thing. And then those are the elements that we're really tackling with being radically royal because in my eyes, I view some women, you know, who feel like they're less than a woman because they're choosing not to have kids. And that's because that's the pressure that society tries to put. Right. And I'm like, let me tell you something. <laughs> this little checklist that everyone else decided to create for you is foolishness because yeah. that's just say you are a woman period, you know? <laughs> so mm -hmm. that's the whole point uh, of it because, you know, if it were up to other people, I would be married with like three kids and two dogs by now. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's just yeah. like, no, and there's nothing wrong with you just because you're not moving as fast as what other people think you should be moving. So yeah, that's overall the goal of that. And then there's like another event that we usually have in March. Um, and that is more for a lot of us who are doing the balancing act of being women, um, entrepreneurs, um, creatives, influencers, things like that. And this one, a way for us to network in that, in the aspect of sharing what you do, um, sharing resources, connecting with one another, because I think sometimes it's like we're pulling straws, like if we're mm -hmm. trying to put together events and we don't really know who to ask or yeah. participate and things like that. So that's a mutual space where we're able to do that. But that's more intimate where it's a smaller group and we can like learn business strategies, um, even how to manage self-care while we're also doing all these extra things that are going on and understanding that we don't have to be superwoman mm -hmm. all the time and that's okay. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Ideally, with Royalty Refine, we do a lot of community engagement things like behind the scenes where yeah. we support and contribute to um, different causes like RAIN, um, domestic violence agencies, um, and things like that. So, yeah, I love that. that I, I, that's wonderful. That's so beautiful. Um, I, I love when you were talking about like almost like trusting the timing of your life. Like, I know that's like a, a quote and a phrase that people like keep saying, but I feel like it's really important, like, especially for women. Um, I mean, for people in general, but yes, for women, like we're always like, oh, you know, our, our clock is ticking or like, as, and, and in society, we live in a society where the older you get, the less value th mm -hmm. that you're given, like youth is so praised and it's so worship, right? Like everybody wants to be young. Nobody wants to grow older. Like they're, they're almost afraid of doing it. And um, even though there's beauty in aging and becoming more wise and more experienced, um, it, it, social media, for example, can make you feel like, oh, well, I haven't made it. Like, I'm never going to make it. No one's ever going to care about me. This person just popped out and they got like thousands and thousands of followers. Like, do you ever struggle with that, with like comparing yourself um, to other people or like to other people's journeys? Oh, yeah. In the very beginning, um, yes, I felt like there was something that maybe I was doing that was wrong, right? Because I'm just like, okay, you know, this person isn't really saying much, but, you know, they have like 20,000 people and I'm like, I'm being very intentional and, you know, purposeful for, with what I'm sharing and I get like five likes, like what's mm. up? And then, you know, also in the very beginning, I think for me, I've allowed a lot of people to get in my ear. Um, because, you know, those boxes, right, that we always talk about, um, which is how my, the idea came from my third book, because for me being so calm and very introverted and like to myself, no one would have ever expected me to be a public speaker. They're kind of like, did God tell you to do this? Or is this something that you, you know, decided to do on your own? Like, oh, yeah, yeah. I have a lot of 
things like where people, instead of just celebrating the fact that I was vocal for the first time about my sexual assault or, you know, things like that, they're like, well, maybe next time you should probably use like a lapel mic instead of a, can we focus on the message here? Like it was different. (laughs) It was different things like that. Then it was like, well, maybe you should put yourself out more and, you know, X, Y, Z. So I allowed those voices to get to me. And that's how the comparison started. Mm -hmm. It was kind of like, well, if you look at this person and how they're doing it, then maybe you should try it that way. But then I had to understand that it didn't feel right. You know, trying to do the way that somebody else did it. It's almost kind of like you putting on a suit that wasn't custom tailored for you. That's good. Like, you know, I, I'm, I, everybody know I'm a jeans and t-shirt girl, right? <laughs> so me trying to walk around in six inch stilettos, it's uncomfortable for me. That's how it is when you're trying to imitate somebody else. Because with comparison, you're often going to imitate or try to duplicate somebody else's content and realize you're not going to get the results that you need because that wasn't the lane crafted for you. Yes. So I, I love that. Yeah. I'm telling you, girl, I'm like, you know, sometimes it's, like, it's like I had to really understand that what's for you is for you. And just because it may look different um, to how others may do it doesn't mean that it's wrong. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate you being honest about that because I struggle with that too. Comparison and then feeling like, like if if you if I only get five likes, like does it mean like what I said was trash? Like do people not resonate with it? Does it not matter? Um, mm-hmm. And and something something that you said about like fitting like a, the suit, I love that example. But it's 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 amazing. I think especially when you're like starting something that isn't a thing, like when you're starting a whole another lane, there's not going to be a blueprint. Right. So you trying to you trying to do something like somebody else is not going to work because God is like, no, I focus on me. Like and I understand like people have good intentions. They do. They really do. I mean, some people do want to sabotage other people or make them feel like what they're doing isn't is worthless. But Mm -hmm. I feel like it's really important for us, like to one, be clear on what God told us to do. Like if, if I gave you this vision to do it instead of Googling it and seeing like, oh, how do other people do it or like. Is this, what, is this already being done? No, just do it because there's only one you, right? There's only one you. Nobody can do it like you. Right. And so God gave you your experiences, your, you know, your quirks and like little things like that to add to like this mosaic. And you have to play your part. You have to play your part. You have to be your piece, you know? So I appreciate you being honest about that. I do. Well, I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes uh, now, like, I think right now I'm just kind of blown away of how things have been happening um, for me. Cause you know, it's always one of those where you're kind of like, I should be further along than this or you know what's going on, but I'm really understanding timing patience and really manifesting in the moment is is there for me um, because what's happening right now is supposed to. And I Mm -hmm. feel like if I were to put my hand involved in the process and try to rush something, it's just not gonna come out right. And so I'm like, all right guys, I'm listening, you know, yeah. um, and so what I do, I, I just enter in whatever it is that he's showing me or telling me to do, and I just do it, and I'm just like, I'm going to yield the results of this process to you, because yes. if you tell me to do it this way, then there has to be purpose and power behind it, so yes. I'm, I'm going to just follow your lead, and you know, for someone who is often, you know, has a type A personality, it's hard, yes. <laughs> it's really yeah. hard. And then a recovering perfectionist at that, please. No. So, you know, we are our toughest critic. And so it's just more so stop, you know, apologizing for who you are. Um, Really stop questioning or doubting yourself Mm -hmm. because God is telling you to do it. Like you say, for a reason, like if it were up to me, I would have never in a million years thought I'd be a public speaker, (laughs) author, any of that, because again, I'm very private. I don't want everybody in my business, you know? (laughs) So, but you know, to really be an introvert called to operate in extroverted spaces, you got to find that delicate balance. You have to. And I think the reason why God allows me to move beyond my comfortability, it's because he knows that, he's going to get the reverence and glory. Because if I did something that I was just so comfortable with, then I would think it's my own power and might as to why the results happened the way it did. That's good. That is, and it's so real. It's so real. Like, especially in today's society, like everybody's telling you to like, do, like to hustle and to go hard and like to make stuff happen for yourself and blah, 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 blah. everything that's very anti like God, right? Like, <laughs> 
you can't do anything for yourself. Everything that you do for yourself, like is going to fail. Like it's, it's dust, but what you do for him will last. Right. So like, if he, that's so good, like submitting, like, okay, God, I'm going to do the, I'm going to go through the process and I'm going to submit the results to you because what's, what is real too, is sometimes I have to tell myself, maybe I was only supposed to reach out to five people, the five people that like, and why is that not okay? Why is that? Because I'm looking at other people and trying to be ambitious and trying to like be worthy like them. When God is like, no, I just, I just need you to, I need this one person to see that post and like, you know, and now like, they're going to follow me. They're going to, there's something that sparked in them. You know what I'm saying? Like playing our part. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. So you mentioned, um, that you're, that you're basically, you're on your third book now. (laughs) Yes. You're an author. So like, how did you, like, how did writing play a role in your life? Like either where you were writing when you grew up or was it just like when you became older? Like how did, how did writing play? Um, what role did writing play in your life is what I'm trying to ask. So um, (laughs) in hindsight, so the the very area in my life um, that caused me the greatest pain is also the very area in my life that introduced me to purpose and um, the death of my father. Um, I truly believe because we were super close, like I was a legit daddy's girl, like legit. Um, (laughs) And so when he passed, it shook me. I was just like, wait a minute, you know, how is this supposed to happen? Wait a minute, what? And so knowing the questions that I would get, like now I'm, I'm very open with it on how he passed, but before it was hard for me. Um, and so um, when he passed, um, I was in high school and I was placed in a grief group, but I didn't know I was placed in a grief group. It was weird. It was like, I heard my name on the intercom and I'm thinking, I didn't do anything like I had just got back to school after, you know, taking a little break after his passing and things like that. And I'm like, what? And I was called into like a room. And so when I got there, I noticed that it was another group of students in that same room. And then there was a social worker. And I was like, OK, what's up? Yeah, and they're yeah. like, oh, this is a grief group for, you know, if you lose a loved one. And so I'm like, this is weird. Right. Oh boy. And so, OK. And so for me, again, like I said, I'm already dealing with the public behavior and everybody already got their hands and stuff, you know, on the situation with my family, this made me retreat even more. I'm like, okay, here we go again. Like I'm tired of being known as, Oh, that's the girl whose father passed away from an explosion. Like, I don't want to hear that. You know, Mm -hmm. I don't at all. And it's just like, Oh, or the ones who knew my father, Oh, that's Tyrone's daughter. You know, the one that was killed on like, no, you know, so when I got in there, I was like, great. What did they already know about me before I walk mm. in? So um, I wouldn't talk to anybody, you know, in the room. And the social worker gave me a notebook and a pen. She says, if you're not going to talk to anybody, at least write down what you're feeling. And you can keep that book. You don't have to read it. You don't have to share it, whatever. And so that writing, um, explaining how I felt like everything that I couldn't get out was in that book. And so I carried that book, guarded it with my life and not really understanding the power and magnitude of my words in that moment. It wasn't until as I started getting older and I would just like write certain things as simple as, you know, um, it could be like a cover letter. It could be a recommendation. It just could be, you know, assignments for class, you know, when I'm in college and I would always get the same thing. Like, the way that you write, it's so floetic. Like, I don't think you understand the, your writing style. And I'm just like, no, I mean, this is just how I feel in the moment. And I have to like really sit in my emotions and, and process it that way. And so it wasn't until um, an older cousin of mine had introduced me to, um, her name is Tamika Hall. And she was like, I have a cousin who is like a phenomenal writer and I told her that she really could be an author, but she doesn't believe me. And so um, I sat down with Tamika Hall and she was just like, okay. Um, she kind of like gave me like a topic and was just like, no, what would you say about this? And I was like, hmm. And then I just kind of wrote it and then I sent it to her. And she was like, have you ever thought about <laughs> you know, being an author? And I was like, well, I actually have some writing, you know, from my experiences of different things that were going on. And so that's how that first book was published with writings that I had already collected. And so um, she was like, 
I don't want you to feel any way when I tell you this, but there was really nothing I had to change. You were one of my easiest clients that I've ever had. And I said, what? And she was like, please don't stop. And she says, matter of fact, I'm gonna hold you accountable (laughs) and you're not gonna stop because I don't think you understood how each of your short stories in this book Mm -hmm. resonated with me. And she said, you were freeing yourself, but the liberty that you had of sharing your story and releasing it has now helped somebody else. And that's how I understood the power of my pen. (laughs) Yeah. 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 No, that's, that's great. And, and I do, I do agree oftentimes when people, this seems to be common, like when people free themselves or I guess seek freedom or do the work to become free, um, they in turn free other people with their liberty. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's not, it's not just a selfish act, even though there's nothing wrong. I don't mean selfish as in like um, bad selfish, right? We should be selfish. We should take care of ourselves. We should um, heal, do the work that it takes to heal and to to work through things, no matter how long it takes. Mm -hmm. But it's not just something for ourselves. It's for other people too. And Mm -hmm. um, and even though I don't think that we should go into healing, thinking about other people, um, but right, right. But like, you know, take care of yourself first, but sharing that, um, sharing that freedom is liberating to other people, mm-hmm. is liberating to other people. And it's, it's so interesting because um, I feel like when I do see you, I think of freedom because I, I you're just so vulnerable and you're like, it's to me, it seems like you don't care. Like, and I don't mean don't care as in like, you're like, oh, whatever. But no, yeah. like, you're like, this is who I am. This is what I do. <laughs> this is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm yeah. not going to do. <laughs> you know? It's true. Um, that, that is me in a nutshell. And it took a while of not, you know, not being that. Um, and, and feeling uncomfortable, you know, going back to that um, restriction of really attaching myself or connecting myself to how others viewed me. And I didn't like how that felt. Um, like with my, my third book, and it talks about um, recognizing your opponent, the greatest enemy is your inner me. And I talk about self-sabotage and I talk about the boxes that I retreated in because at first it felt comfortable. Then after a while, when you know that you're beginning to grow, but stepping outside of the box is a new experience. And it's kind of like, ugh, do I really want to see what's happening outside of that box? Right. And so um, for me, I got accustomed to, well, if that's what they think of me, then okay. And then, or I would try to live up to that expectation of what they said that after a while, I was just like, nah, Tasha, you are enough. Like <laughs> it's okay. You're enough. You're, you're good. Yeah. It, <laughs> you know, <laughs> And so that's I was just like, okay. And you know, everyone who talks to me says that, like, Tasha, you're just so vulnerable. And I yeah. said, because I understand the hindrance of not being vulnerable. Yeah. Yeah. And and I get it. Like being vulnerable is not fun. Like it's mm-hmm. it's scary. It could be painful, especially if it's rejected, that vulnerability. Um, so I get it. It seems like it is freer, right? It's more free to remain, like you said, in those boxes. But like you said. It's, it's like we trick ourselves into being caged yeah. and then, you know what I mean? And like, oh, I have this, you know, I don't know, 50 <laughs> by 50 foot. <laughs> it's like, but then, but then you see this whole great big world out there. Um, and, I, and I feel like, I feel like that's almost like the tax we pay for our vulnerability is people will reject us. Some people will hurt us. Right. <laughs> but remaining free and staying free is sometimes more, it's worth it. It's worth being, well, okay, you don't rock with me, that's fine. But I know who I am. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yes. Girl, yes, I'm telling you. And it, I'm glad you said that because it's so true. I used to be that person, you know, going back to being a peacemaker, right? You don't want anyone mad at you. You're just like, oh. Oh, okay, you know, but now it's kind of like, there had to be a breakdown somewhere that had to happen because either I skipped over the things or the red flags that I should have saw from the beginning. Yeah. Um, and so unfortunately, it had to impact me in a way that was hurtful in order for me to wake up. Yeah. And, you know, being so strong willed, I can't deal with like, you know, the past of this. I won't understand what that means. Like, you know, <laughs> something happens real subtle I'm like "Eh, okay (laughs) but then it all makes sense to me now like even the way God speaks to me like he knows it can't be super like all right Tasha like no it has to be like Tasha I need you to get up I need you to do this and this is this is what's going to happen kind of thing because it wakes me up it 
it enlightens me. It really opens up my eyes a lot more to see the bigger picture, to know that it's not about me, to get out of myself, get out of my feelings, get out of my emotions and get out of what's comfortable and just do it. And I even look at, in a natural sense, my experiences were like heavy hitters, right? Because guess what? If they were like super small and super low key, I would probably still be walking around doing whatever I wanted to do Uh, and be content with it. (laughs) So (laughs) it's like, no, contentment is not a part of the strategy or plan that I have for you. Like you can't keep playing it safe because you playing it safe doesn't mean that you will fully live the life that I've created for you. Yeah. You live it safe, meaning those who are connected to you are not going to receive what I have for them because you still continue to shrink back. Dang. <laughs> it's like, okay, God, dang. Like, like, it's not true. All the <laughs> but it, it's really like that. Like even yeah. when um, I get in moments of becoming too busy, God will wake me all the way up at inconvenient times. <laughs> like, okay. Oh, you're busy, huh? All right. Let me tell you something, okay? Because remember, you can't move unless there's a room made for me. Mm. So I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, see, this is what happens when you're sitting in stillness. You can mm. hear from me clearly. And I'm showing you these things, things that you've asked help for, but you couldn't hear me because your mind was so cluttered with everything else. Girl, yes. Yes. Like, and I love what you said about like, it's not about us. Like at the end of the day, like it's it's really not like, (laughs) it's not about us. Like, even though what we experience is very true and very real um, and valid. uh, I I heard this phrase that said, God doesn't waste pain. Like he doesn't just put you through pain just for the, just because it's fun. Even though sometimes to be honest, sometimes it feels like it. I'd be like, right. (laughs) Like, okay. I don't understand. Like, but then later on, I see that if, if even if my my what I went through doesn't offer healing to somebody, it still offers a safe place for somebody. Like I can be a safe place for other people because I know what it's like to be rejected. I know what it's like to be talked about and to be dragged and to be like, you know, slapped in the face by people the closest to you. Um, and in turn, that makes me want to be a safe place for other people. So I don't impose that same kind of trauma onto them. Not intentionally anyway. You know, we're, we're human, so we fail. But right. um, but it's still... Like, I'd be like, okay, this is why I went through that thing. Like, I can, okay, okay, it makes sense now, right? So in his infinite wisdom, if nothing else but humbles us, right? Yeah. Like, to be like, okay, you ain't got it all together. <laughs> Real quick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and so it, it's so crazy because I just kind of view myself as like a lighthouse for other people, um, even when they feel isolated or alone, Um I know what that feels like. I'm being the underdog, if you will, right? And so those are usually the people that God allows to gravitate toward me um, because not only can they recognize it, but it's almost like they know they won't be ridiculed or judged. Um, yeah. It's just something like, they're like, wait a minute. Yeah. There's something about her. And, and so I really view myself as like that lighthouse for, for those, especially who feel overlooked and, you know, mishandled mm-hmm. i can vouch for that Actually, so. <laughs> we've definitely had a lot of conversations oh yeah <laughs> you know? and so i'm like okay you know yeah. usually the ones that everyone tries to discard god's mm-hmm. like nah, nah, you are the person that they need for real yeah. and yeah. then once they see that they're like okay i can do this i'm yeah. capable and you know just like she was able to deal and overcome i can too mm-hmm mm-hmm no, for real. I'm grateful for you, seriously, because you know there were some dark times. It's like I, know, I yeah. would just let you talk, and I'd be like, okay, <laughs> listen. But I appreciate that. You need that you know? to just listen. You don't need somebody to give textbook answers all the time. You don't right. need to throw or you know project whatever they expect. It's not. No, no. This is your time to be mm-hmm. vulnerable and open up. Yeah. yeah. My goal is to just listen. At yeah. Time. <laughs> yeah and, and be okay with not having the answers like just being like it's okay this does suck I don't know what's going on <laughs> you know what I'm saying like that enough that is enough sometimes um I, I do want to ask you like in your opinion like what does it mean to be a free black woman in your definition Ooh, okay um <laughs> <laughs> I think um being a free black woman is actually being just that um it doesn't matter where you are, where you've been, where you're going and who you're with. You just show up and mm-hmm. showing up is enough. Um, 
just knowing that your presence is what's needed and your presence is what's necessary and that's why you are a free black woman yeah i love that i love that definition um you also called yourself the unapologetic black woman (laughs) and so so tell me a little bit more about that like why why did you choose the word unapologetic Uh, i think a lot of it (laughs) for me um it kind of goes back you know to what we were saying um i always hear this across the board that wherever I am, I'm very consistent, like people who have met me in different areas, uh, whether it was like, through my job, whether it was through ministry, or just randomly, you know, in the store or anything like that. Um, I've always been consistent, always been like, you know, what you see what you get. It's never a charade or anything, um, a performance. It's just kind of like, the takeaway that they have is that, you know, you made me feel warm, you've made me feel welcome, and you just had this inviting presence. And so being the unapologetic Black woman for me is just really understanding that the things that I once hated about myself were actually the things that is what makes me beautiful. Mm-hmm. Um, the things that I wasn't willing to accept or embrace at first are the things I really now conquered and owned and said, you know what, it's okay to be authentically you. Um, you may not be... Um, understood by everybody but it's okay because at the end of the day you are marked you are stamped you are chosen and your name is tasha w (laughs) for a reason (laughs) and so um being who i am unapologetically whether you know people may agree or disagree just know that when you see me what you see is what you get yeah yeah so if you were not saying you're gonna die anytime soon yeah. Um, at the end of your life, like, <laughs> what do you hope people take away from your life? People who knew you, people who will read about your story in books, people who will see the impact that you've made on community um, with people who have experienced trauma. Like, what message would you want to leave people with with your life? Um, hmm. One message I would definitely say that Tasha has always been one that continued to pursue her purpose, her passion, and the process that God had for her, no matter what was thrown her way. Um, She's always been a woman who turned her bad into positive, her lemons into lemonade. Yes, I love that. First of all, it's almost like you had this answer, like, (laughs) prepared. It's so funny, though, because it's like, (laughs) if you know me, I'll be like, "Uh, what do I say? (laughs) And again, it's like never in a million years, I ever be like okay and God is like yeah miss mute because you know my brother used to speak for me when we were kids mm-hmm. like I would never say anything and wow. now, he's like you have so much to say and you really don't understand the wisdom that I have given you and yeah that, like whenever you know I say something or you know do something you know I always sound like a a thesaurus you know <laughs> <laughs> it's all good okay you know I always got metaphors for days and they just come to me they just drop and I'm like, yeah oh. yeah but, you know my quirkiness that I love <laughs> yes <laughs> so if you were to if you were to look at yourself 10 years ago if you could go back knowing what you know now mm-hmm. 10 years ago you maybe even 15 what advice or yeah what advice or encouragement would you offer yourself I usually ask people like what advice would you give other people um, but I feel like sometimes it's really hard for them to be like, I don't know. But like for yourself, <laughs> like knowing where you were 10 or 15 years ago, like what advice did you need to hear um, that you could give to yourself today? Mm, okay. I had to think. I was like, how old was I? <laughs> okay. All right. 10 years ago, um, I would definitely say um, you do not need to add- Attach yourself to a man or a thing to feel valued. Um, Who you are is already credible and what you have is already worthy. So just know who you are without those things and know that you are loved in spite of. That's beautiful. (laughs) That is beautiful. (laughs) So if you would consider yourself a free Black woman, what has your freedom cost you? Girl, everything. Right? No, but for real. Um, <laughs> woo, okay. Um, mm, I would say the main target area is when I think about my freedom, which, you know, I'm already working on something. But um, 
Um, it would definitely, I would say the three areas that really have been challenged the most with mm-hmm. my freedom are family, faith, and finance. Mm-hmm. And I say that because there were a lot of things in my life um, my faith was really tested, tried and true. Mm-hmm. Um, when it came to my health, um, there were like major things that really caused me to question um, if all of this was worth it at all. Like I've had scares where, you know, I was on bed rest before, mm-hmm. like passing out unconscious in different places and doctors are trying to run tests to figure out what's going on. I had an incident um, with scoliosis before and they're telling me that in a couple years I would be paralyzed. I wouldn't be able to walk independently. I've had um, uterine fibroids where they're now like, yeah, we don't know if you can have kids or not, those kind of things. And Mm -hmm. those were moments that really caused me to step back and be like, really, God, like, even though I'm serving you, even though I'm being obedient, why is this happening? Right. And so, but I will say, you know, with all of those things, especially in, in terms of my health, God had stood true to who he was. He was like, I, I told you my record, my receipt, like, come on, you know, like, but it was like, I had to get out of my feelings. Um, and like to even now know that I've beat the odds in all three of those things. And I'm just like, oh, okay, God, okay. But it was more so like in that moment with those three things happening, does your feelings towards me change? Because you know, God is always constant, but it's like, mm-hmm. how would you feel about me? Would you still continue to serve the people that I've assigned to your life? Would you still be open with sharing your story even in the middle of what you may be considered a weakness, would you still remain vulnerable and be open and share the good news of everything else I have done, even while you're hurting? And so that's why those things had to happen. And then even with family, you know, as close as I am to my mom and my brother, the enemy tried to attack them because he couldn't get to me. And Mm so those type of things, you know, so being free, (laughs) definitely, you know, cost a lot, but you know what? It was worth it. Mm, Yeah. Yeah. So, (laughs) yeah, I like that. I think a lot of people think freedom is free and oftentimes it's not, it might cost you, (laughs) cost you everything, right? (laughs) Like old habits, old mindsets, all that stuff. Um, I also want to ask you, I, I, I'm really big on uplifting black women. Like that's like, that's a thing for me. And so, I want you um, to have this opportunity to shout out any Black women that have influenced you either like growing up or currently like people that you're attached to that you kind of want to um, share them and how they've impacted you in your life. Ooh, this is fun. Um, <laughs> well, of course, I'm definitely going to shout you out, Alicia. Okay. <laughs> you're like, to me. Yes, you, ma'am. Um <laughs> Oh God, as I start sweating. <laughs> oh, so, um, you are definitely a woman who has inspired me. Um, quite honestly, I have seen you smile through the biggest hurdles. Um, even when you were like upset, hurting, and even though things never made sense to you, one thing that I valued, I know you, you hate being put on the spot, but it's okay. Um, <laughs> is that, um, you never let the storm take over your smile and the radiance that you have. You never allow those things to really change or alter the love that you give. And, you know, that's something that I used to struggle with, you know, like, huh, like how, what? You know, and and to me, that is a superpower, girl. Like, you know, I've learned from you, like, it's okay to turn the other cheek. You don't have to argue back. You don't have to be loud to be seen. Just the way that you handle things gracefully right there is more powerful than feeling like you have to make a whole bunch of noise to be seen and heard. And so, of course, like, I was like, I need to learn that, okay? Um, (laughs) So you help me, girl, okay? So, um, praise God. (laughs) Things with more grace, my lord. 
Um, Sierra Parsons is another one. Oh my gosh. Like I love her. Um, she'll probably be mad at me and because I'm shouting her out. But <laughs> she's um, amazing. Yes, yeah, she is. <laughs> she inspires me so much with um really challenging me to continue to work on who I am and like knowing that it's a continuous journey. And so even though you know, I am so vulnerable, like, especially in like public settings and things like that, but it's the alone time when you're really sitting in your thoughts and you're really, you know, trying to figure out how to navigate through life. Um, Tiara Parsons, her strength is undeniable. And um, it's just the way that she puts things in perspective Mm. to really make me have an aha moment. Um, And the fact that even with her, you know, having her own stuff and even with, you know, doing her own thing, she always finds the time in the space for me. She invests in the relationship that we had. And that's, that's something I really value because, you know, in the past I used to struggle with like, am I bothering them? Am I, you know, and with her, I've never felt that way. Mm. Um, Another person, I definitely want to shout out my best friend, Dr. Crystal Francis. Um, a lot of a lot of people when they see us, uh, they laugh because they're like, <laughs> "You all are so different, but yet we're so similar." Um, <laughs> like she's extroverted, I'm not. Um, <laughs> you know, um, you know this kind of thing. She's really into politics. I'm not. But what really divinely crafted our friendship is that God knew that we needed each other in the areas that we've lacked and Mm. so he creates that balance where we are able to keep each other on our toes um that accountability she is really um the best friend I never knew I needed um prior to that I wasn't really close to a lot of women you know so yeah um (laughs) she's very inspirational she's the one who actually challenges me to continue to be the leader and be okay with being a leader and not always hiding behind the scenes yeah um yeah there's so many others but you know. I'm, I'm about to say like i'm sure that <laughs> there are you three for now it's all good it's all good uh, you know I love y'all. y'all know i see you but I would be here all night if I shouted everybody out. So <laughs> that's beautiful, though. That, I, I think that that speaks because a lot of people don't have community with. Unfortunately, they've had you know, horrible experiences with women, um, and I hate. I hate that. I hate that. I hate that narrative that like all women are either catty or like you know they stab you in the back because it's not true. Like it's it's not all women. There are some women. Yes, there are some men. Absolutely right. But um, more more often than not, there are behind like they said like every behind every great woman is like there's like on um, this meme is like a bunch oh. of great women in a group chat or something <laughs> it's like I did I thought of one more I'm sorry no go ahead Nicole Johnson um oh my gosh she is she's literally I always say she's like my ace in the hole um so like the way her and I met um we never really understood the commonalities that we shared until mm-hmm. life <laughs> you know life happens and we share a lot of things even from the loss of a parent and in dealing with the family dynamic shifting and things like that but one thing I love about Nicole she is the one friend that will let me have it and be okay with it but say it is such a night and you know Nicole she's she's so nice right (laughs) she's one of those like she's the friend that'll say all right Tasha you're settling on yourself okay, Tasha, you're being safe. Okay, Tasha, you're restricting what you're really supposed to be doing. Like she's one of those. And yeah. she's like, I need you to stop shortchanging yourself. I need you to stop short- shortchanging your gift. It doesn't matter if everyone is going to receive it or not, because you are now adding value to who you already are, mm-hmm. because the people that are for you will be for you. Like she's one of those. And she always, like whenever she feels like I'm not giving myself enough credit. She's the one that to remind me, like, I understand that you're humble, but it's still okay to root for yourself. Yeah. And, um, that's what I love about her. Like she will tell me, like, girl, you know you are doing it, okay? <laughs> like, <laughs> like you sitting here 
you know, laying low, like, oh, girl, it ain't nothing when it, it's a big deal, yeah, you know, yeah. so I do appreciate that. And she's also been the one to really, um, in terms of celebrating myself, like being in that moment and just sit with it for a while, you know, sometimes just like, okay, yay. And then move on. And she's like, you can sit there for a while. You can do it, you know, because you're quick to celebrate everyone else. Give yourself mm-hmm. the same credit. Yeah. That's beautiful. Cause even when you talking about these women, like these great women who are in your corner, um, it really speaks to like, the kind of people you should have in your arsenal, like the kind of people you should have in your camp, right? Like someone to call you out on yourself, someone to help you to celebrate yourself and really be present in what's going on right now. Like someone to fit the parts that you don't have, you know, to be, to learn more, to experience more, to teach other people. Like, um, yeah, I, I love it. Uh, thank you so much for sharing that. I think, I think that's great. Um, so before we, before we wrap up, I really want to give you an opportunity to like, shout out all your things, like let people know how they can support you, where they can follow you, where they can find you, all that stuff. Okay. Um, so I have a website, www.tashaw.net. Um, there you can actually kind of read my bio, background information about me. You can also learn more about Royalty Refined. You can also find ways to um, like book me for upcoming events, things like that, um, whether it's just an author, meet and greet, an appearance, um, having me speak or, you know, whatever avenue I'm always willing to serve in that way. But you have to book me. Hey, Saint, you got to book me. Um, <laughs> and then you can also um, look back and kind of see what upcoming events and things like that that I have. Um, I also provide clarity consultations. This is something new for me. Um, for others who may be interested in writing or others who have an idea, but they just need help with articulating it. That's something that I do. Um, so you can also book those there. I have a um, Facebook page, uh, Tasha W, um, and then also the Royalty Refined group. And then on Instagram, um, Life with Tasha W underscore. And yeah, I think I've covered them all. <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, yes. Please let people know um, about your upcoming conference, too. I think that. Oh, yeah. Okay. So the Royalty Refined conference is September 26th. It's from two to five. It'll be held virtually, okay? Because COVID, thank We want everybody to be safe. Um, it's $15. You can register on Eventbrite. There's going to be an amazing group of panelists um, where we'll talk about the different areas, marriage, mental health, and motherhood. Um, three major components that we all can resonate or relate to. Um, you don't have to be a mom to understand the art of motherhood. I promise you. I'm not a mom, but I get it, okay? So, um, We'll also have an amazing um, MC, um, Ashley Burton. Um, I really think that, you know, not saying it because it's my event, but I really think this is something that'll really be transformational. It's definitely not your typical conference. It's really something where you can kind of glean from one another, um, walk away with some things and definitely um, learn how to apply and assess the things that are going on in your life and how to carry them with you wherever you go. Yeah. I love that. I'll be there. I'll be sharing it. I'll share all the information you just shared. So I'm excited. (laughs) But yes, thank you so much, Tasha, for your time, for your story, just for being so vulnerable and so open here. I really appreciate it. And I know a lot of people take some stuff from this, from this interview. So thank you so much. A plant one seed. That's all I ask. (laughs) Yes, that, that. So yeah. (laughs) So thanks again, guys, for, um, I guess, tuning in for another episode of The Free Black Woman. Please be sure to follow Tasha at all the things. I'll put them in the description or in the link. And so you can check it out and you can register and share it with all your friends. Okay. So until next time, guys. Bye.